Right now, it is a little bit after dusk, because that is when all the combat went down. That's when Rosie was instructed to wade into the pond, smeared with oatmeal, and say this uh, moked in prayer at twilight. And that's the last thing that has happened. Has that actually taken place? Or yes, you've completed the ritual. You guys have, after that, you completed a one-hour short rest. It's now... Uh, now getting a lot darker, because previously there was some illumination in this area from the sunlight streaming in through the top of what is essentially this, this cave. Uh, but now the sun has set, and... You just have torches laying on the ground somewhere. Here. So is the plan to move back tonight, or is the plan to take a long rest here and leave in the morning? Didn't, uh... Didn't, uh... Wendy miss out on a, uh... On a rest back at uh, Asara Fall? She did. Hmm? If she skips her long rests tonight, she'll be making con saves or take exhaustion. My con's pretty good. I, I'm willing to take one night if you guys want to head back now. We are on a timetable. Yeah. yeah. That's a good point. And there will probably be some point that we can catch a rest. Alright. Okay. So, yeah. so head back tonight. Yeah, we'll start back yeah. tonight. Exhausted and bloodied from the Yakman excursion. And as you guys pack up, Razu gets dressed and dons her armor. Yeah, I need to make sure I turn that back on. <laughs> and you leave White Mother's Spring. The sound of Thud Thud noisily eating the Yakmen begins to fade behind you. Ah, 17 armor class. <laughs> He's like tiny baby armor class. <laughs> Sorry, he's got the hit points to back it up. Uh, where's my random encounter table? There it is. Oh, he found it. Darn it. I did find it. Darn it. Were you hoping that I didn't? Or that I had forgotten? Maybe a little bit. I actually found a really detailed one on DM's Guild that I like. A really detailed random encounter table? It's like a whole random encounter module, basically. It's enormous. That's neat. I always enjoy making up the reason why the random encounter happens. <laughs> Who is our navigator as you guys are moving overland? back towards the Moakton village. Uh, who's got survival? Because I don't. Uh, I think it was Birdie has Birdie it. Birdie or uh, Adrax was good at that kind of thing. Ross could do it too in a pinch. Birdie's got it. Yeah, I don't have the skill, but I've got plus four. Well, I'm assuming That's Wendy's it. not doing it because Wendy's being like a scout. Mm-hmm. Okay. So Birdie's doing it. Birdie, go ahead and make yeah. that uh, survival roll. Um, are you can carrying, I aid carrying so we light? can do it at advantage? Birdie, are you carrying any light? Uh, no. No? Okay. Uh, no, don't Never do it at advantage, me. because you're in dim light. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Rasu has dark vision. Could, could I aid that? Rasu can, but Adrix cannot. Okay, then. Rasu will aid and give him advantage. So that would be 24. As you're marching back, you realize something's not right. Uh, it feels like your, your feet are not going the right direction. You become a little apprehensive about getting lost. And you can read the same apprehension on River Leaper's face, though... So far, he hasn't spoken up. And... Wendy, are you still out flying circles, even though it's nighttime? Yeah, I'm going to fly circles, just because, worst case scenario, I can spot other things with light. 
And I doubt I'm going to lose our party. Make a perception can... check at disadvantage. You're flying, but you get, you're using a bullseye lantern, so you can only see a, sp a little bit small spot on the ground at a time. Oh, good roll, though. That's a 21. 21. You think the terrain that you're flying over, that your companions are trudging towards, that you know you're going in the right direction just based on where the sun went down and where you emerged from the hillsides, the land looks more rugged than you remember in the journey out. And you sweep your bullseye lantern backwards, and you realize you're either... You must be way further ahead of your companions than you thought. Because throwing your bullseye lantern out behind you, you can no longer see them. Huh. Does that seem odd to me, or does it seem reasonable that I could have gotten lost? I'm going to assume Wendy's smart enough to not travel that far away from her companions. Yeah, and so I'm going to assume there's some, some shenanigans going down. And Wendy's had some experience with fairies, so she knows that shenanigans may happen okay <laughs> so what is her response to this situation i'm gonna go check out what's going on on the ground because if something's happened to me then chances are pretty good that uh i'm not gonna spot it up here okay. and birdie you quickly realize the same thing where you become accustomed to seeing wendy's light sweeping back around every <sighs> couple of minutes at least. You realize now you've been marching for about 20 minutes under the moonlight and you haven't seen her once. Uh, guys, Wendy appears to have disappeared. Huh. You don't think she passed out, did she? When was the last time I saw her? Does she usually go outside of eyesight? I mean, she's carrying that lantern. That's how you usually spot her, because you can very clearly see her bullseye lantern as she comes back. Uh, and you realize you haven't seen the lantern in maybe 15, 20 minutes. You know at nighttime, she does not scout further from the party than she would during, uh, during the day when she has better eyesight. She tends to stick closer to you. Maybe we should stop. Make a fire, that way help her find a way back. What's the terrain like? Very rugged. And you, for a while, as you were marching, you thought that maybe you were coming back from a slightly different route that you took out to the spring, having left the spring itself from a different exit. Uh, but now you're not sure. Rugged is in hilly or overgrown or what? Uh, both in places. You're climbing okay. over a lot more rocky outcroppings. You're cutting through a lot more foliage. Uh, no, that seems reasonable to me. I think we, if we go up to the top of the nearest hillock, chop down some vegetation, start a fairly large fire, that might work. Okay. Is that the plan? Yeah. We'll need to post a watch, though, in case that yeah, way we don't. Watch duty. Ross will take first watch. How many do we need? Three? Um, Adrix will take the last watch. I'll take middle. So you guys climb up to this hillock. Uh, you identify the closest one. You climb up to the top of it. Uh, a kind of gravelly, maybe 20 or 30 foot slope. Yeah. And there's a large boulder sitting at the top of this little hillock. Uh-oh. And it I comes to that. life and squashes you all, predictably. <laughs> it was another mimic. Uh, no, you Oops, all life. mimics campaign. <laughs> oh, man, it's going to be messed up when we find out the whole plane is a mimic. <laughs> all of Sigil was a mimic all this time. You get the fire going, and, Bertie, you're for the first to realize this large boulder laying here isn't actually a boulder. It looks like a toppled statue. Okay. Guys, this is uh, not a boulder, it's a statue. Is it partly underground, or do we just see the top of it, or what is the statue of? It takes you a few minutes, because it's very 
largely worn. Uh, and it is partially pressed down into the soil of this cliff. But it looks like a dwarf, of all things. What's Some a dwarf? Some thing. Anyway, anyway, whatever, whatever party member says it looks like a dwarf, or that's Red's response. What's a dwarf? What's a dwarf? And Windy, Short Southling. A few moments after you land on the ground, you do see on a hill nearby this large fire strike up. All right, Red, let's go and investigate that. I'm going to investigate it from the skies, though, just so I can get a good look. And when you do come over to camp, you see your companions building this fire and investigating what looks to you like there's this large hunk of rock. I'm going to land to, to perch down on top of the statue. Oh. Wendy, did you get lost? I think we all got lost. None of this resembles what we looked like on the way here. Fair point. And this is when River Leaper chimes up and you see he looks mildly distraught and he tells you that perhaps because of the Mokden's strong tie to fey creatures or perhaps of you know your intercession into white mother's spring most likely some kind of fey presence is doing this and windy nods fey every time Fairies are the worst. Birdie wants to uh, investigate the statue. Just look for any like markings, any indication of possibly its origin, other than you know it's dwarvish. Do you speak dwarvish at all? No. Okay, then no, it just looks like a large statue of a dwarf clad in mail. Uh, there's some crumbly bits laying around the statue that you think if reconstructed might be a large battle axe that he was holding. I mean this this thing's been laying here for. Who knows? Many hundreds or thousands of years. Very. I'm gonna look. Go ahead. Sorry. I was just gonna say I'm gonna look it over with them and maybe like look for a maker's mark. And I'm gonna use my mason's kit, masonry proficiency. Uh, go ahead and let's call this intelligence plus your masonry kit. You got it. Wow. Five. Oh well, gotta burn the low ones sometime. Mm -hmm. No, just wait for combat, like McDole does. Uh, <laughs> other than just the the weather wear on this thing, yeah. just the years of pounding rain and shifting gravel and whatnot, uh, it's very difficult to make out any other details other than just the vague shape of this dwarf. Who would you make think... a statue of dwarves here? And Red asks, what's a dwarf? Does anybody answer him? Razu, Razu responds, say, a, a short southling person. I thought, I thought those were called halflings. No. The, 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 these ones, like, cultivate massive beards. They're like Are they related to gnomes? Probably. <laughs> They're like all the other... Earth. They all think that they have a monopoly on morality. Southern lands are strange. <laughs> They're savage. The closest thing to dwarves that you guys might be familiar with uh, in your lands would be kobolds. Because kobolds are tunneling creatures. They work stone very effectively. They build oh, so large cobalt cities. with beards. Cobalt with beards, yeah. Birdie you slam on tours out of nowhere. <laughs> Alright, well, we've got this camp. I don't think it would be a good idea to go any further tonight, even if we are being bedazzled. Yeah. Bedazzled? <laughs> yeah. Partway through the night, before anybody gets the benefit of a long rest, you hear howling <laughs> like a wolf very, very nearby. So who's on our first watch this evening? 
Rasu. And where's Rasu taking this watch from? Uh, probably near the base of the statue. Okay. So if you're sitting... I'm going to the... roll a d4 to see which watch I'm going to be. If you're sitting right. at the base of the statue next to the fire, uh, essentially part of your watch is going to be having to get up and patrol around the statue periodically so you can see down yep. the other side of the hill. And it's just after one of these patrols, just as you're settling back down next to your sleeping companions, that you hear this howling. And it sounds like it's right on the other side of this statue. And there's no way a wolf could have gotten that close without you seeing it. Uh, pick up her halberd. Very carefully look around the other side of the, uh, the statue. And you take your halberd, go on your side, no light source? No, but uh, dark vision. Okay. Well, keep in mind, dark vision, your passive perception is minus five. You're in, you're in a dim light on this side of the statue. And when you walk around, you don't see anything. There's no trace. You hunker down and look at the ground, expecting paw prints or claws or something, and you don't find anything. Rasu lights a torch from the campfire mm -hmm. and then goes back to investigate more thoroughly. Okay. You go get a torch. We're going to say that this big monstrosity here is our dwarf statue laying there. Picture like the mm -hmm. background of Sagat stage, if it helps. Okay. <laughs> oh, this is a much bigger statue than I was picturing in my head. Which is why you guys just thought it was just this huge like rocky outcropping at first when you climbed up on sure. top of this hill. Yeah. It took a minute to realize you were looking at little details. So we'll be over here and you're investigating the other side? Uh, flip that. Put you guys towards the middle. You got it. I don't like my PCs being that close to the edge of the map. That's how you lose PCs. Okay. <laughs> they, just, they wander away and you can't find them anymore. It's the worst way to lose a PC. And yeah, Ross, you go around once more on the other side of this... Uh, the statue, this time you take the light, you're peering down the side of the, the north face of the hill, and just nothing. You just hear the sounds of the evening wearing on. Rosa goes ahead and takes another lap around the uh, statue. And no matter how many laps you take, nothing changes. Uh, Brick, quick question. Yes, sir. Uh, Adrix is resting with his heavy armor on. Do you want him to make a constitution save or whatever? Constitution check? Uh, you get back half as many hit dice at the end of your long rest as you would have otherwise. All right. Yep. Fine with me. No, it'll help me clarify that when I couldn't find the rule in the book. It's tricky. <laughs> so, Rossi, what's next? If there's no other, if there's nothing else eventful, Rossi is going to wait until, until, uh, Red wakes up for his watch, and uh, she's going to tell him about that. Okay. So Red, Rossu tells you that he heard, or Rossu tells you that she heard a uh, a wolf howling nearby. How close? It seemed like it was right on the other side of the statue, but when I went over there, there was nothing there. Uh, do you have a torch right now, you said? Yep. Uh, let's go over and see if we can find any tracks. Sure. Can I uh, make What's a survival wrong? here? Uh, there's there's no need. The only tracks you find with diligent searching are the ones that Rasu left when she did a couple of circuits around the statue. Nothing else coming or going. And unless they're ridiculously hungry and from everything I've seen in this area there's plenty of food wolves would never approach people this closely indeed not real not normal wolves orcs maybe some sort of weird fake creature I'll keep an eye out sure I'm going to bed okay and Ross you drifts off to a restless still slightly oatmeal covered slumber Passes off the torch to uh, Red and crashes yep. out. Delicious slumber. Okay, let's roll some initiative. 
What? We did it, fam. <laughs> oh no, I started using fam ironically. No, just use it That's... sincerely. The next lesson is unironically. That's the straight line. Uh. <laughs> uh. Uh. Alright, I gotta mark it myself. You sound so agitated by that. God damn. <laughs> So much nicer than me having to type it in every single time. Oh, it's the best. It's so, so yeah, good. The farm's really good. I need to uh, get one of these for my own ga home games. I have one for a home game. It's on the it's on the dice tower. Nice. They just move it all around. It's great. All right. Little magnet thing. Yeah. Windy, Rasu, Birdie, Adrix, and Red are surprised. Surprised. What else is new? Are, can Birdie be surprised? Birdie's if asleep. I'm, if I'm asleep, so yes, I can. Okay. Red, can I please get a charisma saving throw? Mm-hmm. Uh, if this is against magic, I have advantage, and the default is a uh, 16. It is not against magic. Here's what you feel for a moment. You feel extremely cold for a moment, even though you're sitting you're sitting close to your fire. Somebody, draw me out where you have guys that have this fire, just in case somebody falls into it during this combat, which would be hysterical. And you're also Probably sitting on top of a torch, it looks like. Okay. Uh, so you're first aware of just this biting cold, much colder than the ambient chill in the air. And then for a moment, you feel this just primal anger and hunger take over you for a second and you shake your head and it's swimming for a moment and when you come to floating just above you is what looks to your eyes to be a transparent werewolf reaching down with its claws uh okay so windy is everybody except for red go ahead and make me a quick Constitution check. If you beat a 10, 20, I'll let you act this round. The ambient shuffling and noises that Red makes on his. Uh... I think I just make that. Birdie has a 16. How did I Wendy do? do? Just... A 23. Okay, so Wendy, you just kind of stir from your sleep. Is anybody still asleep this round? Rasu. Rasu's still asleep, snoring away, sawing logs over there. And yeah, you, you see this same creature floating above Red. And you see Red start to get to his feet. Windy, you can go ahead and act. Alright. I'm gonna stand... So this creature's floating above Red, so I can hit it from next to Red? Uh, yeah, if you're standing right next to Red, you can swing up the air at it. All right, so I'm going to swing up in the air at it with my longsword. Okay. Uh, that's a 23, as I just kind of, like, give this piercing whistle and swing into its face. Go ahead and give us a piercing whistle. <laughs> that was like a... That was like a oh! <laughs> <laughs> oh. Sorry, I'm, I'm bad at whistling. Go that ahead. was the best I could do. Go ahead and roll damage. So you created this character as a challenge to yourself. Yes! <laughs> and I get, like... So I'm okay at whistling once I pick it up, but it takes me, like, a few seconds to get started. I don't know how to fix that. <laughs> Whoa! Oh, that's a shame. That's, uh, 14 damage. Okay, and your sword goes right through this creature. It's like it's not even there. It offers no resistance. It's just like slashing through empty space. All right, I'm going to step back so you can, he can take a swing at me if he wants. Uh, can't you key movement to get away from him? Yeah, I could, but I don't want to. How does a 15? Not going to do it? Not going to do it. Yeah, it lashes out with its claw as you step back. And as Birdie kind of wakes up, I'm going to press my plus one arrow into his hands. Okay. And 
Rossi, at this point on the ground, I mean, you're just starting to stir awake as you hear commotion, but you're not ready to act yet. Uh, yep. Birdie, just about the time as you're waking up and getting to your feet, Wendy presses an arrow into your hands. Uh, Birdie looks at it for a moment, looks up, and then uh, grabs his bow and takes a shot at the werewolf fly the floating ghostly werewolf roll it so that would be 13 plus 6 18 I to hit. hit yep okay So that would be 11 plus 4, 15 plus the 1 from the plus 1 arrow, so 16. Okay, go ahead and mark that plus 1 arrow off. Even if you recover it, it's no longer magical. Yep, I'll mark it off my sheet. That's only fair. And is Birdie moving or staying put? Uh, staying put. Okay. And you throw this arrow through this thing, and it passes right through it. Again, just like it's, you're attacking empty space. But as it does, as your arrow disappears out into the night, the thing recoils in pain and lets out this unearthly howl. This very echoey, horrifying scream of pain. Red, you going to do something about this? Uh, yeah, let's go ahead and, as a bonus action, I will... Uh cunning action to disengage i will move back to here i will take my quiver off of my pack i will drop it here and as my action for the turn i will take out the wand of flame arrow and cast it on the quiver okay sorry i forgot to silence my phone as well and i have i have no idea if that has any charges left in it no but i do yep so that's 12 hours arrows in that quiver that everyone should be able to, uh, I'll draw on the map, get access to. Okay. And last for an hour. Okay. Yeah, and it's concentration. I'm concentrating on it. Okay. Okay. Adrex. Yeah. You're also going to have River Leaper acting on your turn, and he's going to follow okay. your lead, whatever you need to do. I like your little quiver here. That's very nice. <laughs> I don't think I can damage it. Um, is there? So this fire, mm -hmm. are there like logs and stuff in it, like twigs and yeah, you something I can of kindling you found laying around? There's plenty like, of dry. I basically foliage. just want to take a twig and throw it at the ghostly apparition. <laughs> okay, so Ghost Tape Fire, right? A That's true. Weapon attack. Alright. Ghost do hate fire. I don't I have proficiency problem. in Twigs now. Kindling, in kindling, so won't be adding my proficiency bonus. <laughs> <laughs> it's a six. six. Uh, do I have my strike? No. No. Six. Take one point of fire damage. So you Ow! the fire and you grab up one of these burning logs and hurl it and Maybe not the best idea you've ever had, <laughs> uh, but everything you've heard about ghosts, you're thinking, man, if I try that again, but I actually hit it, maybe I will damage it. <laughs> Are you moving or staying put? Uh, let me stay put. Okay. What's the worst can that, that can happen? I don't have a River Leaper stat block ready, because why would I? I mean, I'm just running the game here. <laughs> he has a crossbow, not a bow, so he can't use any of the flaming arrows. I've got a spare short bow standing right next to him if he wants to take it. Yeah, I'm going to say he's too manly for a short bow. I've just been carrying this stupid short bow. i got to sell it somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> So he fires a crossbow bolt, but again, no apparent effect. It just sails right through this creature. And now everybody gets to make a saving throw. Do a 
Wisdom saving throw. DC is oh, 13. I don't Just like whatevs those. saving throw. And this is also non magical. This is non magical. Oh. I did it! I, I did passed. It. <laughs> passed. Barely. Skin of my teeth. Okay. Cool. River Leaper passes. Did anybody fail this? Rasu, you're making this too. I was muted. I'm sorry. Razu passed. Razu passed. Okay. 21. As this thing leers down at you and just lets out this, once again, horrifying howl. It sounds somewhere on the edge of death. And you steal your nerves against it. And none of you pee yourselves. Nice. I love not peeing myself. And how much speed do I have here? Five, ten, fifteen, twenty, twenty-five, thirty, thirty. <coughs> and the thing drops to the ground. Scampers around your flank. Sets his eyeballs on Birdie. Always with the kobold. You're just the tastiest. It's gonna bring us back to Windy. Well, to be fair, I am snack sized. <laughs> true. <laughs> I'm gonna grab this. Uh, quiver up, grab. I don't know how many arrows can I take. Just to toss them into my quiver. As long I'll as you're say... standing next to the quiver, you can take all your however many arrows you can fire in a round. All right, I'm just gonna take uh, an arrow and fire it at this guy right here. Okay. The actual spell rules for this: it's a Xanathar spell, I do believe. Yeah, yeah it's yeah. the flame arrow spell. Yep. That's no, decent yeah. fire damage. All right, that's a 16. 16 will hit. And the damage is... That's 10 fire piercing magical. 10 is the total? Uh, yeah, do you need me to break out the fire and the... Nope. I just wasn't sure if you were doing that or not. And this thing, again, as this burning arrow launches forward... Uh, the fire ignites this ghostly visage for a moment. The thing recoils in pain and screams horribly. Moving or staying put? I'm going to stay put. Rasu, you're now officially to your feet and probably a little pissed off. A little bit, yeah. Let's, uh, let's, let's, let's go and interject myself between Birdie and uh, Ghost Werewolf and okay. halberd the crap out of it. Very good. Uh, how does a seven do? Seven's not going to do it. Yeah, that's what I thought. And you swipe oh, out well. at the werewolf, but your halberd passes uselessly underneath it. Mm -hmm. Don't worry, I went through it too. Birdie, what's up? I'm going to uh, grab an arrow and sh shoot over Rasu's shoulder at the uh, ghost werewolf thing. Okay. So that is a that is a twenty. Twenty will hit. Okay. Uh, I need another d six. <laughs> so that is twenty damage. Okay. Twenty. Okay, McDonald. Did you have the? Did you? Do crit damage for the your fire too? Yeah, he did. Yes. Okay. And once again, you sail this arrow through it. And the fire seems to have a brilliant effect on this creature. Oh, there's, uh, there's just... moving or staying put. I am going to move back to this side of the fire behind Wendy. And as he's running around, Birdie uh, yells at Red to get his uh, silver daggers out. I was about to. Red, it's your turn. Uh, I will toss Adrix my short bow. Okay. Then I'll move to here and drawing a silver dagger. <laughs> ah, that'll hit an armor class of like nine. And you lash out with it, but uh, the thing being ethereal and kind of floating above the ground, you're not sure if you made contact or not. Bonus Adrix. action, pull out the second silver dagger offhand. Okay. That'll hit an armor class of 22. That's much better. It's a better roll, yeah. And I need a four. And uh, 
So this is a combination of silver and sneak attack, obviously, for 13 damage. Not bad. 13 damage. Man, once again, you stab through this thing with your silver dagger. Just like stabbing open air it has no apparent effect. Doesn't seem to work. Adrix, you snapped the short bow out of the air that Red tossed over to you. No. He, it drops <laughs> on the ground. <laughs> <laughs> because Adrix's action is going to be to light two torches. Okay. You're just reaching over to the fire and lighting them up? Yep. Light two hand axes on fire. Okay. It's not quite what he's doing, but yes. Is he going to throw the torches? Red... Mm -hmm. I have a 17. Yep. And a 10. No. Oh, that's the wrong die. There we go. Eight points of necrotic damage. Mm -hmm. This thing lashes out with its claw. And you feel that coldness again all through your chest. It tries to also lash out with its jaws, but does not find any purchase. Oh, that brick road. Yeah. Uh, that was a bad choice, because uh, lol sentinel. Well, not a bad choice. I mean, he's the one who actually managed to hit him. Yeah, well. <laughs> <laughs> Tell you and show Kidding? you why that was a bad idea. Uh, that is a 22 to hit. 22 will hit. I'm going to put some conviction stank on that. <laughs> that sounds wise. Yeah. Eh, not great. That's a uh, twelve damage. Twelve damage. Yep. For a moment, the fires of your conviction light up the area and burns brightly. And by the time it fades, the ghost is no more. The night once again falls silent. Adric sitting there holding two torches. <laughs> Looking really sad. I didn't do wielding torches. Yeah. I was and he makes a stabbing motion with the torches. <laughs> Probably hurts himself in the process from the flames, but the rest of your night passes uneventfully, but your long rest was interrupted, and nobody gets the benefits. Wendy moves over and adjusts her arms. Adjusts his arms so they can torch better. <laughs> Why can I not mark off a spell on my spell list? I have to step Spellers. away for two seconds to respond to a semi-important text while you guys regroup and plan your next move. Two second windows. So that was one of two dumb things I was pondering doing. What was dumber too? <laughs> we do have a potion of fire dragon breath. Well... Oh. That seems like a not dumb idea. That seems like an entirely reasonable idea. Except <laughs> I'm a white dragon that has cold breath. <laughs> so then I don't know cold how that works. and then fire. Oh, it's fine. Like, does he just burp at that point? That's just borrowing. <laughs> <laughs> so let's see. I lost one arrow. You guys fired two arrows out of that quiver I dropped. Yeah. It looks like there's ten left. Okay. Okay. I refreshed my character sheet and it did dock me the uh it did dock me the thing. Okay. So yeah. Burnt a torch. I suppose we should all burn a day of rations. I thought we didn't have to because we have what's the oh, name right. with us. Right, 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 right. Keep those rations. Might need them one day. All right, my apologies. You know how it is. Goddamn millennials and their phones. No. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe. Maybe. Says the millennial. <laughs> so yeah, nobody was able to get a good night rest last night. Although, if you were doing anything else, like working on uh, crafting or doing any kind of things with your spellcraft or magic items, I'll let you go ahead and take those actions yeah i'll i didn't really need the long rest so i'll spend a uh the night working on poison you said that was eight plus 15 minus the check i make with a poisoner's kit yeah you i'll let's call that either intelligence or dexterity whichever you want oh excellent either one uh, i don't think it matters actually because i rolled pretty poorly birdie 
wants to uh, n now that Red has whipped out that uh, that one Red uh, Birdie is now incredibly he remembered it existed so he wants to look spend the thing to l examine it like he's been doing with all the stuff assuming Red will give it to him <laughs> no yeah Birdie seems more proficient at uh, figuring out magic items so yeah you can borrow it I could do some uh, some potion crafting some light potion crafting if you guys prefer but I have to burn some of our gold. I don't have any personal gold. <laughs> I've got you marked down as having already identified this potion, or this uh, wand, as the wand of... Oh, well, I, it, it's identified, yes, but I wanted to see if I could... Uh, remember how I asked you, can we can we identify runes from wands? And your answer was, that's a very good question. Yep, and it's still a very okay. good question. I, that's uh, what I'm trying to do. Are you, you, you don't know how many more charges this wand has. Are you so, to like, any of the charges? That's probably not a good idea until we waited, like, maybe a day or two. Because we don't want to burn this wand out. If we burn this wand out, then it's useless. I mean, we've had the wand for, like, a week. We don't know that it regains charges. I don't, I'm not saying that you can't burn charges. I don't care, personally. <laughs> I'm just saying that I, your logic is not necessarily correct. Okay. So, well, I mean, I, I wasn't going to burn any charges. I was just going to... No, you don't get any more insights on the one than you've already gotten. No, nah, darn. Okay. And the next morning, you wake up next to this giant dwarf statue. The sun comes up. We're now on the morning of day five of ten. Whereabouts? All right, now that we got a, now that we got a better look about... Can we see, like, the river where Seraphal? Now is... that we're this close, I should be able to just fly up and see it. And if I can't, then we're definitely not in the same place. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, Go ahead, I'm going to mm. take a dive up into the air to check that out. How high? Uh, let's call it 300 feet. I have good news and bad news. Yeah. Wendy, you do see the river by which you realize you can reorient yourself. You know the direction and distance. It does look like you've wandered somewhat off course, although not as much as last night's events led you to believe. The bad news is those of you around your camp, as you're breaking your camp and Wendy takes off, it looks to your eyes like she flies into the air and then vanishes after a few moments. Mm. Hmm. And after confirming, I'm going to attempt to shots. Chestnut. Wendy, where'd you go? Wendy does not hear anything from the ground. What's next? What kind of, uh, what happens when I try to fly back down and let them know? Wendy just kind of miraculously comes back into view, and you land back down at the statue at the camp. How far, how high up is she when she reappears? Uh, difficult to gauge exactly, but far inside the range that she should disappear from view. Like, it doesn't look like she's flying very, very far away. It just looks like she mm. pops back into view. When I'm flying back down, mm -hmm. do I see them on the ground? You do not, until you come in and you're uh, about to prepare to come in and land. And that's when you see the smoldering of the campfire, the statue, and your companions kind of pop All right, back in that case, I'll, then I'm essentially going to be like, so the good news is... I don't think we're that far off ground. The bad news is there's definitely some sort of magical trickery going on here because I couldn't see you from the air. Magic. And I'm going to look towards our resident magical expert, Birdie. <laughs> <laughs> see, Birdie's not really a mag. I'm not really a magical expert. I just kind of poke at things and try to figure out what they do. Birdie, All right, so I'm going to... I'm going to take my short bow and I'm going to fire an arrow 100 feet in that direction. Like, so it lands 100 feet away. In which direction? direction uh, in which? this direction. Okay. Do I still see the arrow when it lands? You do. Uh, 150 feet. How many times are you going to repeat this process? What's the max range on a short bow? 320. Uh, I will repeat it three times. 100, 200, and 300. Okay, and you fire several arrows. And I'm going to say at 300 feet, you're probably not going to be able to see the arrow anyway. But when you go out to retrieve it, it's 
where you expect it to land. I'm not gonna go and retrieve it. Um, who's got the best eyesight, Birdie? Probably Windy it? during the day. Windy, can you see it from over there? I'm trying yeah. to figure out where the if there's a 300. I'm trying to figure out the range of this perception thing. Yeah, and I'll attempt to Make get a, a glance at it. It would normally be Birdie, but it's during the day, so I think he takes like a minus five. Oh yeah, Birdie sucks yeah. during the day. I, I just roll everything. I rolled a one though, okay. so. <laughs> You don't see the arrow at first, but when you fly in that direction and then land at the range indicated that you do find it stuck in the ground. And I I bring it back and I just say, yeah, I wasn't able to see it at all until <laughs> I got there. Rosie said, shrugs and says, well, I suppose we should press on anyways. If uh, some kind of presence is trying to, trying to fuck with us here, then... They, mm -hmm. they, they'll, pro they'll, they'll assert themselves if we try to go too far, I suppose. Alright, I can at least show you the direction that we should be heading in. Okay. The, uh... That works. The ritual we performed basically was beseeching aid of a fey goddess. Do you think there's some sort of terrible bargain we made without realizing it? Generally, when you make a bargain with a fey goddess, you realize what bargain you've made. Um, you might not realize the consequences. But usually they very much enjoy having you understand that you're making a bargain. And I didn't hear anything. Didn't hmm. hear, didn't see or anything. Well, let's head back to town, I guess. You guys straight camp and tiredly move on. And after uh, 40 or 50 minutes of marching, the river comes into view. That you recognize and you're able to follow the rest of the way back to town. Oh, well, that was not as sinister as I expected it to be. Hmm. Although, you know what that reminds me of? Uh, the, hmm. the disappearing and thing? That reminds me a lot of the what the village has going on. That's true. Yeah, you're right. Speaking of the village... It was an M. Night Shyamalan movie that was not as bad as everybody thought it was. Still pretty bad, though. No, you're just... <sighs> it's not the worst movie ever made. <laughs> Although, interesting, the worst movie ever made actually is an M. Night Shyamalan movie. So. <laughs> Lady in the Water? No, not even close. Sad to say. <laughs> you guys arrive back at Asera Fall. And this time... Rasu, as you approach the village, you can see the structures and the Mokden moving about. Hmm. You approach well, and cross over the bridge into the city. And the reactions you get from the people here as you come back are immediately very fearful. They see a hobgoblin marching back into town. When they realize who you're marching with and who you must be, that fear subsides. And the rest of you make it back to a Seraphal. This is just going to be like that fable with the wolf. Going to get too used to hobgoblins. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so what's next? Well... Something weird happened to us, and somebody was very protective of their information. I'm going to go talk to the, to the town chief. Okay, let's go ahead and get some late morning actions from everybody. Ooh. Wendy's going to go talk to the chief. What is Adrix doing? Do me last. Do you last? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> What is Birdie up to? I want to go with Wendy, because Birdie's very interested in trying to potentially get his hands on the library that the village chief has, <laughs> if he can. Uh, Red? Uh, the leather worker, Kenyon Perry? Is that correct in my notes? Uh, it's possible. I'll know in a second. I was going to go pay her a visit. That was the one I heard the uh, town folk, I overheard the town folk talking about, right? Yes, the Perry family are clothiers and leather workers on the edge of town. 
That was okay. 12 or 13? Uh, 12. And what is Rossu doing on her first visit to Asera Fall? Oh, that's what Adrix is doing. Adrix is going to babysit Razu. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, Rasu is just going to familiarize herself with the town. Not really. Since this is her first actual crack at it. So where does Adrix take her then? Where does Adrix take her? That is a good question. So you didn't get out of making a decision after all. No. Um, Mother Stackpool is in... Uh, let's go meet Mother Stackpool. Okay. She's in 8, right? Yeah. So, Rasu, Adrix takes you to the farm. Uh, the Stackpool farm, where you see this nice vegetable plot. <clears throat> out back where they're growing plump turnips, etc. Mother Stackpole is sitting out on a bench doing some knitting as you guys walk up. And she gives you her trademark mischievous grin as you approach. She sets her work aside, stands up, and greets Rasu in her very best common, which is acceptable at the best of times. Rasu bows and says, thank you for uh, extending hospitality to my companions yesterday. She leans forward as she sniffs you a bit. Rasu sniffs her right back. She rocks back and says, you don't smell as foul as I've been led to believe you would. Well, I imagine I smell like that oatmeal stuff you had me bathe in yesterday. You actually do, and it, it's not it's less like oats and more like a kind of tobacco-y smell that you've been stewing in for a day and a half now. But yeah, she welcomes the both of you. Uh, she offers to draw a tub of water for Rasu to wash the ooks off with. Ra- Razu gladly accepts. Okay. <laughs> She calls back to the farm. What are her farmhands' names? I thought I had this information. Jeff and Sephiroth. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> <it. laughs> They're from a uh, from an RC channel, so sort of 1998. Yeah. <laughs> XX Jeff XX. <laughs> <laughs> Alan and Mabin. That's basically Jeff and Sephiroth. Yeah, Jeff and Sephiroth. Uh, two teenagers that are staying in the Stackpool house with you all. They they do all the menial tasks. They work the farm now that Mother Stackpool is too old to do so. She barks some orders at them in Mokedon. They go get this big metal tub from the house, carry it down to the river, and begin filling it with water and dragging it back for Rasu. She then inquires about your experiences at White Mother's Spring. She asks you how it felt when you came into contact with White Mother. I felt nothing. I felt, you know, well, first, the, uh, the, yak, the yakmen that attacked us while we were up there... <laughs> They 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 had the they had the they had the sense of timing to wait until after I uh, after I had removed all of my armor to attack us then so that was fun. At the mention of being attacked by yakmen, uh, first she verifies that you're saying the words she thinks you're saying. Yep. And yeah, yeah. So he he means yakmen. You know, the yakmen. She. <laughs> And having verified that, Mother Stackpole's eyes get very wide. She says, truly, monsters more fearsome and dangerous than even hobgoblins. Eh. They were no thing, Adric says as he checks to make sure that all of his teeth are still in his mouth. 
the plumber <laughs> a little bit loose. <laughs> Nonetheless, she informs you that there are leftovers from breakfast inside on the table. I will absolutely help myself. Okay. While waiting for the uh, while waiting for the farmhands to uh, to drop the water. Yeah, they bring back this tub about half full. By the time they get back, the first kettle is hot. They pour the hot water into the tub. And after a few repetitions of this process, you have water in which to soak in. And Razu pulls her armor back off and and soaks. And enjoys every minute of it. What is Adric's doing back at the stack pool house inside? Eating. Just gorging himself? Gorging himself, yes. Lovely. <laughs> Probably more than is, like, polite or appropriate. But he almost died, and he feels he's entitled. <laughs> Red, what is your business at the leather worker's house? Um, I actually wanted to see how much it would cost to commission a set of uh, studded leather. But I was also going to try and poke around and see if I can find out anything about this uh, ritual sacrifice of an infant. Okay. But without <laughs> just coming out and saying it, it must be subtle. Just knocks on the door, they answer it, the snake man's here. He's like, yeah, I'm here about the ritual sacrifice. That's the thing I would does. like to purchase your finest studded leather armor and ritual sacrifice, please. <laughs> They are leather workers, but they're not armor crafters. They'll be able to... I mean, they obviously don't have any for sale. And even if they did, this is not a town where they use coin. Uh, yeah, he's more than happy to commission a set when you go in and speak with uh, Father Bledden. There are two children in the house as you come in. Uh, very young, six and four, and mm -hmm. the mother, just like you heard at the the kind of the washerwoman speak about, is very reserved. In fact, she doesn't even come out to to greet you. Make a make an insight check. Sure. Uh, how am I doing on blips? <laughs> uh, yeah, I'll spend two to reroll that. Okay. Not much better. Uh, that'd be a 13. So how do you broach the subject of their dead infant? Uh, so, uh, well, I, you know, I'm, after we're, well, we're talking about the armor, I'll just kind of offhandly mention, oh, these must be your children. Are, is this all of all of them? Do they help you here in the shop? And when you ask him, he tells you that they had uh, a baby die last winter. And he kind of just leaves it at that. I'm sorry to hear that. Were there, was there a famine or something or just a disease? He tells you that winter uh, can be very harsh on the people here. And he says it very abruptly, very gruffly. He asks how long you're able to wait on the completion of this armor. Well, we have a timetable for what we're currently doing, but I could always either try and come come back myself later. Uh, I don't know how long we're planning to be in town. How long would it take for you to craft it? Well, we can apply our new crafting rules. 13 years. You're wanting studded leather? <laughs> yeah. Uh, he thinks about a week of labor. Mm-hmm. Uh, provided you can get him a source of metal uh, or something he, uh, that he can use as studs. Oh, I happen to have this sword I took from a Yakman that you could break down. So, where were you carrying this gargantuan sword? 
just kind of this is basically the only like big thing in red's pack because remember i did pick it up at the end of the last uh, session oh, this doesn't go in your pack you'd have to have this kind of strapped on your back or okay hang yeah i mean that's what i mean like it's yeah. strapped across the with his pack on his back and you tell him it's a yak man blade yeah and the first thing you see when you mention the yak man is fear but then also relief when you mentioned you took it off of a dead one. He asks, I mean, he, he clarifies you had a, a scrape with the Yikari. Yes. And you're very fortunate to have gotten away alive. Oh, we killed all of them. But you're right, it was it was a not exactly an easy fight. He says they are barbarians that come down from the hills and they're known to use dark sorceries and he says that very contemptuously like he doesn't believe it uh maybe another insight check there we go uh 21 he's repeating something that's been told to him over and over mm -hmm. again but you don't think this man has ever seen a yikari barbarian and yeah, you get the sense that he doesn't believe the stories that he's been told. No, that that would be accurate to our uh, fight. There was a uh, an Eden that they had somehow mind controlled, or at least mind controlled half of. Wasn't very about happy about that one. The other half snapped him out of it. So, what are you able to offer him in trade for the construction of this armor? Studded leather costs uh, 45 gold, but he's not going to accept coin. Well, the rest of the metal and the swords, this is just a, such a ridiculous thing. And uh, let's see if there's anything else I have in my inventory that he might want. Is there anything he specifically wants so that I could, you know, go out and get over the course of the week it's going to take him to get to uh, make it? If you enable him to keep the metal in the blade... Mm-hmm. He says he might be able to find use for it. In addition, he says perhaps you could since you're the village heroes and all slaughtering orcs and Yikari and whatnot. He says that he had an argument with his neighbors, the Carey family who run the smokehouse. Mm-hmm. And he's noticed that his portions of meat for his family have been dwindling as of late. He's leaving the sword and smooth things over with the carries, and he will be more than happy to try his hand at making armor. All right, I'll see what I can do. What was this guy's name again? Bledin. Bledin, what was his last name? Perry. Perry? Bledin Perry. That's a good syllable away from a fantasy name. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, most uh, Welsh names are. <laughs> Thanks to uh, fantasynamegenerators.com. Wendy and Bertie were headed over to the large structure, the town hall. Yes. To speak with Father Oliver. Yes. You're walking <coughs> into the home. You're greeted by the smell of... Whatever sort of soup or stew Mother Oliver is cooking. Father Oliver is happy to see you made it back safe and sound. Uh, he trusts that your hobgoblin friend found her way back as well. And uh, Wendy will nod at him and reply, We have some news for you as well that might be valuable. And I'm going to go ahead and tell him about that the Ikari are number one near his village and number two lying in wait at his secret spring that Eden has moved into the area as well and seems to be making itself at home and then I ask him if what he if he's had any uh, if he has any knowledge of what could have happened to us in the forest on the way back he tells you that as far as the Ikari are concerned the same glamours that protect the village against goblins protected against Yukari barbarians. As long as uh, 
As long as the Mokden stay within the borders of the village, the Ikari pose them no threat. As far as monsters being in the location of the spring, that's kind of something they've dealt with now and again for generations. It's a prime uh, area at the foothill of the mountains, kind of just on the border of Ikari territory. And it's one of the reasons that pilgrimages to the spring have stopped in recent generations. It's just too dangerous. As far as what you experience in the forest, he listens very intently to the story, but he can't make heads or tails out of what might have happened. It sounds to him like you guys lost your uh, lost your path on the way back and ran into monsters on the road. Does it seem like he's being genuine? He's never heard of anything okay. like this magically happening out there, but he's heard of many, many travelers losing their way in the wilderness. Bertie, you're sneaking downstairs to steal all the books? <laughs> no. Uh, I was. I am going to a- ask him one more time if I can. Because, like, the party consensus was no. We don't steal. We're not going to steal the books, and Bertie will respect that. <laughs> but he is going to ask if he can see them. Uh, to... Uh, but Bertie wants to bring up one thing. He says, is there any reason that the, uh, is there any way that since the spring is connected to the glamour around your village somehow, is there any, uh, reason you need to be worried about them? Do they know, do they have any idea that you're in the area? He says that the Yikari are one of the reasons, uh, the village is hidden in the way it is. And he just reiterates that they have nothing to fear from the Yakmen as long as they don't encroach on their territory. And the Mokden really have no reason to go up into the mountains. Mm. You get the sense that when he's speaking about Yakmen, they kind of uh, they kind of breach the subject as, as though they're boogeymen. 